Hi. Um, I wanted to recap some of the stuff from this morning on um, October 1st when we had uh, Dika Kulges, our guest lecturer, talk about addiction. Um, so she introduced this term mesocortical limbic, um, which really just refers to the ventral tegmental area and its projections, especially to the nucleus accumbens and a little bit to the cortex. Um, she talked about um, uh, a few statistics as well about um, uh, different um, prevalence of use and abuse of different um, drugs, and um, you don't need to remember the exact details, um, but we will, uh, we will talk a little bit about alcohol uh, on Thursday. Um, and she, of course, talked quite a bit about opioids and also a little bit, um, we're also going to talk about cocaine's mechanism on Thursday as well. Um, but uh, as we're sort of also leading into more discussion of dopamine and Tourette's and ADHD. Um, and then um, we will, um, uh, but yeah, the, the opioid stuff um, she covered, I think, pretty well. Um, she talked about um, the distinction in the current uh, DSM about substance abuse, which is uh, essentially an individual act of inappropriately using a substance um, versus substance use disorder, which is a sort of continued abuse. Um, there's a lot more subtlety to that, but that's um, sort of the general overview. Um, she pointed out that, of course, drug use can be a sign and drug abuse can be a sign of underlying mental illness. Um, and it can also in, uh, in worsen um, or um, cause depression or anxiety or other diseases. Um, she talked about, and we're going to discuss again on Thursday, some of the um, uh, mechanisms of tolerance and withdrawal and dependence and so on. Um, she pointed out um, uh, uh, that often um, uh, people who have substance use disorder um, are able to um, uh, go long periods uh, with abstinence. Um, some people experience relapses and others don't. The frequency and severity of those relapses, as with any chronic illness, um, varies from person to person. Um, she also discussed um, withdrawal, physical symptoms associated with withdrawal. That varies by drug, um, emotional symptoms, and also learned associations. Um, and one of the things, um, an interesting study that came out a few, uh, now a few decades ago, looked at um, uh, Vietnam veterans and opioid abuse. So Vietnam veterans had been, um, there was a very high prevalence of opioid use among um, soldiers in Vietnam. But then when they left that environment and left the learned associations for what they'd sort of associated with opioid use, um, the rate of returning vets who were um, uh, um, addicted um, who show, or showed signs of addiction and abuse um, upon return um, was much lower than what would, one would expect. And so that indicates that there is a sort of learned association between using a drug and being in a certain context. Um, as with other things, there are biological, psychological, and sociological um, uh, um, aspects related to addiction. One thing in particular um, that she mentioned and we're going to also continue to be thinking about is the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens, which is this pleasure area. Um, one of the things um, that she discussed in particular in her slides, um, and one of the studies that you should be aware of, is the study um, by Wolfram Schultz um, in 1993, I believe it was. Um, and in this study, um, what the researchers did was um, look at dopamine releasing neurons, the firing pattern of dopamine releasing neurons. First of all, when a monkey is getting an unexpected reward, then the ventral tegmental area the neurons start firing a lot, releasing a lot of dopamine. Um, if the monkey learns that a tone predicts a reward, then um, after the monkeys form that association, the dopamine neurons start responding uh, in response to the tone, rather, and then the, since the reward was expected, there's no increase in firing rate. Um, so um, since the reward was expected, the animal's not so excited about getting it, but is excited about the tone that says it's about to get a reward. And then um, when the animal is expecting a reward following a tone and then the reward doesn't show up, then there's a pause in firing, a decrease. And so that, um, that tells us that these neurons signal reward, or first experiment, they signal expectation of reward. Um, and then they also, by slowing down their firing and slowing down the release of dopamine um, from these neurons, signal disappointment. Um, one other study that she discussed um, that you should be aware of is um, a more recent one by Zhu et al., um, a PNAS study. In this study, they gave um, mice different daily doses, so a daily dose of, do of, of morphine, 
um, either a no dose or a very low dose or moderate or higher and higher dose. And what they found is that as they increased the daily dose of morphine, what happened is the animals um, uh, responded to that by needing more morphine when they experienced pain in order to get relief from that pain. Um, and so the, the, there are many mechanisms going on, but one in particular is removal of opioid receptors. So chronic activation of these opioid receptors leads to their removal. We're going to discuss that and the implications of that a little bit more on, um, on uh, Thursday. Um, so, uh, oops, what the heck that was. Um, so, so yeah, so, so you should, um, be, uh, um, thinking about that. Also, she discussed the circuits of involved in pain sensation. Um, so in pain sensation in general, when something painful happens on your skin or deep in your body, that cause, um, a sensory neuron called a nociceptive sensory neuron to release glutamate and also, um, some other neurotransmitters, um, to activate a neuron that then sends that pain signal up to your brain. Um, endorphins, enkephalin is an endorphin, will bind to opioid receptors and decrease the amount of release of that glutamate um, and also hyperpolarize the postsynaptic cell and inhibit the postsynaptic cell so that it's less likely to, uh, so there's less signal and that postsynaptic cell, whatever signal does come out, is less likely to pass on. So what that means is when pain arrives in the, uh, on, at your skin or somewhere else um, in, in your periphery, um, the signal of the pain doesn't get to your brain because the communication of that pain signal from these sensory neurons to the neurons that then are going to project that signal up to your brain is interrupted. Morphine will do the same thing, but then, um, as, uh, as she discussed, um, chronic use of these drugs causes removal of those receptors. Um, and so then that will lead to an, in, uh, an enhanced, an increased need for morphine um, in order to get the same analgesic or pain relief effect. We'll talk more about that um, sort of circuitry in the presynaptic and postsynaptic inhibition uh, on Thursday. Um, the next, uh, of course, like I said, you should re review the Zhu study. Um, and so they were asking, how does the daily dose affect then the, the effective dose to relieve pain? So they gave different daily amounts to these mice, and then they measured how much it takes to relieve a painful stimulus, um, to, to stop the mouse from responding and jerking away from a painful stimulus. And what they found is that the higher dose led to more needed to relieve the pain. And so the conclusion is that the brain adapts by removing opioid receptors, like we said. Um, so um, the next study that you should know about um, is this Hawley study. Um, so in terms of background, first of all, before getting into the study in general with that, um, uh, first of all, stress will activate the hypothalamus to release something called CRH. Um, also known as CRF, because everything has two names. That then triggers something, uh, a nearby organ called the pituitary gland to release uh, something called ACTH, which then releases cortisol. This is the body's stress response. And then both CRH, also known as CRF, and cortisol will bind to receptors throughout the body and in the brain and activate a stress response, get the animal feeling stressed out. Um, one place that these CRH receptors are found is in the ventral tegmental area. Um, and so in this area that's involved in um, uh, pleasure and, um, and also disappointment. So what then, um, th for this, it's okay to ignore the anterior versus posterior VTA. Um, uh, even though she discussed that, I think it's fine to just not worry about that particular distinction. So um, what they then are testing um, they're interested, their question is about what is the relationship of cortisol and CRF, also known as CRH, um, in um, the VTA in stress. So their manipulation has two parts. First, they have this chronic social defeat where these mice are getting, these little mice are getting beat up by these big, big uh, scary mice over and over again, and then also getting stuck in a room where they're seeing and smelling this mouse that keeps beating them up, even if they're not constantly getting beat up. Um, so then like, you know, every day they get beat up, and then they have to spend hours hanging out with the mouse that beat them up, um, which is stressful. 
Um, and then the other part of their manipulation is injecting either a control solution or um, a CRF antagonist, some the drug that blocks CRF receptors, into the ventral tegmental area. And then what they measure is how much these mice self-administer cocaine. So as we're going to be talking about on Thursday, cocaine causes pleasure. And so these mice are essentially administering cocaine to themselves to relieve the feelings of stress. And so what they found is that, first of all, in control mice with no stress at all, those mice give them, do learn to self-administer cocaine. In mice that were stressed out but had no CRF block or no CRF antagonist, then they got more, they, they administered more cocaine to themselves. So that's this brown, this dark brown, gray bar here. Um, we're not going to worry about the anterior um, uh, right now, but uh, the anterior versus posterior. But then when they gave the correct, in this case, um, CRF1 uh, receptor blocker, um, in the correct part of the ventral tegmental area, in this case, the posterior ventral tegmental area. So essentially, the stressed out mice, when you give them a CRF blocker, they give, you get less cocaine self-administration. And so the conclusion from this is that blocking the CRF receptor prevents stress signals and leads to less addictive behavior. Um, and also there's sort of a caveat to this that stress in general can lead to later drug use. Um, so, um, so if we ignore the CRF mice for a second and just compare the non-stress versus the stress mice, the stress mice are self-administering cocaine more. Um, like I said, you don't need to worry about the two different types of VTA, uh, two different types of CRF receptors, or the anterior versus posterior VTA. Just um, uh, sort of, in, in other words, just sort of ignore this sort of middle bar here and think about the CRF blockers and the effect that has. Um, this study actually also is useful to think about in terms of follow-ups. Um, uh, uh, Dika suggested some potential follow-ups that we might be thinking about. Um, so um, one follow-up that she asked about was how to take this into a potential treatment. Um, when you're working on your reports, this is a useful thing to be thinking about. Um, but um, one way that you can think about follow-ups for your reports is how can we take what we learn and turn it into a potential treatment. Um, there are, of course, ethical considerations that would come into play if you were actually going to do this. But for a hypothetical sort of the, uh, uh, just thought experiment of a follow-up, um, giving humans CRF receptor blockers might relieve or prevent addiction. Um, but other follow-ups you could think about, um, somebody suggested in class, what about um, how does this affect not cocaine self-administration, but maybe opioid self-administration? That would be another great follow-up um, to do. Um, another thing is, how is this happening? So um, we might uh, imagine that there's a difference in the number of CRF receptors or the number of opioid receptors or the number of cocaine receptors, actually, and the number of um, dopamine receptors. Cocaine doesn't bind directly to a receptor. Anyway, the number of uh, dopamine receptors or something else, and so trying to figure out how that's going on would be another possible follow-up. And those are the sorts of things to think about with your um, other paper, um, with all of your research articles. Lastly, um, or she talked about several other things in terms of treatment. Um, one thing she mentioned was bupropion. Sorry, I can't pronounce that. It's, uh, the, it's more commonly known by its um, uh, brand name, Wellbutrin. It's a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. We will talk about that when we talk about major depressive disorder. Um, she also talked about um, some things uh, as well in terms of treatment, um, counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, spiritual or mindfulness-based approaches, um, um, pharmacotherapies um, like buprenorphine, bu bupropion and naloxone and other things that she talked about. Um, and then also the um, destigmatization and decriminalization and how that can help impact treatment. Um, we will return to some of this as we talk about other diseases, and we will and I will recap some of this on Thursday. Um, but the studies that you need to know in particular, the Holly 2016 study, the Zhu 2015 study, and the Schultz 1993 study, um, those are ones that you should review on your own. Uh, and then, of course, post questions on Piazza and so on. Um, so I'll see you all on Thursday.